in small business cybersecurity. We're going to concentrate on the basics. That was a brief bio. It's in the uh, presentation as well. This is a t uh, the topics we're going to be discussing today. We're going to talk about the threat overview. And it's worse than it's ever been in our history, and it continues to be. We're going to talk about the technical, practical tips, and you can see them listed there. We're going to talk about the human aspect, which is a major part of uh, what we're dealing with around the globe. We're going to talk about ransomware, which is part of uh, what can happen uh, if you're successfully uh, engin social engineered. And then some takeaways uh, from a, being a small business ourselves. I really believe in having, okay, I listened to all this, but what, what, what can I do? What can I walk away and do today? I have um, slides about that as well. So that's our agenda for the next 30 minutes. And uh, Lauren, I'm gonna turn the technical aspects over to you. Would you please take it away? Okay, thank you, Len. Thank you very much. And, and again, uh, uh, hello everybody. Uh, happy to be here this afternoon. And, and, and to, to one of Len's points there, I, I do have a, uh, fairly strong technical background. I've been in, in management for many, many years, but I still can drop down into geek speak pretty easily. So, uh, you know, if, if I say something, uh, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. If you have a question, be happy to try to, to answer it. Uh, so, you know, this slide's titled The Daily Barrage. And, and, and you know, I'm sure, sure you all uh, just like we uh, see these see these articles or, or news blasts, you know, practically every day about another organization that's that's uh, had a data breach or had a ransomware event or or even individuals that you know. And that, you know, I see them here in the Finley docket in the local newspaper about uh, scams and falling for scams and, and losing you know a lot of money in the process. And this is just going on and on, it's been going on for many, many years and it doesn't really look like it's gonna slow down. Um, and in evidence of some of these, they see in the bullet items, uh, some popular names, organizations and events that you've, you're probably familiar with, uh, the most recent solar winds uh, activity that, that reached uh, you know, a, a lot of press. And then uh, and even more recently than that, an issue with Microsoft and their exchange server and uh, that falling victim to, to hackers and exploiting organizational systems. So uh, it, can, it continues to be in our news and in our minds and hopefully not in your business. Go ahead, Lynn. So, you know, the question is, what, what if this happened to my company? Um, you know, how would I recognize it? What should I do? You know, am I, am I completely helpless? Or are there activities that that I can do to help avoid becoming a victim of, of these uh, these data breaches or ransomware events or scams? Next, please. So, and what are some of the statistics telling us? Well, um, businesses, and and this is you know across the board, so it's probably slanted a little bit by some of the larger businesses, but. You know, this is a statistic that's really pretty astounding when we look at $8,500 per hour due to ransomware-induced events. <clears throat> and when you, you look at the next bullet where, uh, you know, organizations are affected, three to 14 days of downtime. And, uh, you know, the, my job before I came to Cooper, you know, was partially, um, hopefully minimizing these events, but as well as recognizing and recovering from it. And even there in a large manufacturing environment, there were some incidents at remote sites that were, you know, uh, two, three days in terms of, of downtime. And in a manufacturing environment, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, so just think of that number of 8,500 per hour times, times days, it adds up pretty quick. And then, you know, the, there isn't any good news that's following this. The, the last bullet item talks about the future. And today, when we see a ransomware event, we'll see, um, you know, maybe a few computers that are, are taken down. We'll see uh, data that is encrypted and, and uh, made unavailable for use. But the future that they're saying is, is taking down and holding hostage, whole networks and, and whole accounts. And, 
it's just uh, expanding uh, way beyond what the what the uh, issues are today. So here's some here's some numbers uh, to, to to take a look at just to see the magnitude of this from a dollar's perspective. Now, <clears throat> these these numbers reflect uh, events that have been reported, um, and you can see that that very large number, the top one for business email compromise uh, that that occurs uh, way too frequently, and that is almost two billion dollars. Of, uh, of losses there. And then on the right, you see ransomware and it's in this, you know, just under $30 million. And you say, well, you know, I see ransomware in the news all the time and I don't see the business email compromise in the news quite as much. Why the big difference in the dollars? Well, again, it's, it's those that are reported. So ransomware events uh, may not be reported because uh, oftentimes they're, they're handled internally and they don't necessarily in, involve others, except for the impact on, on business partners or, or customers, you know, if you're down, that, that would involve others, but legally it, it may not. Where business email compromise uh, always involves some other organizations and involves the flow of money and people not getting paid that, that thinks they should be getting paid. And, and so for example, uh, uh, one example of this would be a, an organization gets an email saying, uh, 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 hey, uh, you know, I didn't deliver payment for this particular product. And so, and, and maybe it's because, you know, the uh, account numbers changed on, on the bank. So here's the account number that we want you to send this money to. Well, you send the money and it's not going to the real person or company that should be receiving it. So now you have another company saying, hey, I didn't get your money for real. And, uh, and you're sitting here saying, well, I sent you the money. I have an email. You told me where to put it. So you have this engagement with other individuals that ends up being uh, not just a dollar a loss, but also legal issues that almost has to get involved with others and have it reported. So what can a small business do to prevent becoming one of these statistics? And and the, the answer to that is, is cyber hygiene, practices of cyber hygiene. So almost all successful attacks uh, are, are, can be attributed to, to basic cyber hygiene um, activities or lack of those activities. So uh, here's some examples of, of what cyber hygiene is made up of and, and some of the statistics around it. So, we see 57% uh, uh, of data breaches attributed to poor patch management. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, they make it sound really easy. Well, all you have to do is patch your software. On the other hand, you know, it takes time and resources to do that. And sometimes there's not so pleasant side effects from patching software. So it, it tends to get put off or not recognized as being as important as it is. But you can see by the numbers, that plays a very big role. Um, and then privilege credential abuse is, is even higher. And we'll talk about this more uh, a little later, but essentially this is the, uh, uh, the likelihood or the, the, the habit today of, of people running with administrative privileges on their laptops. And, and you may or may not know that you have administrative privilege because uh, a lot of companies set the devices up that way as a default. Uh, but in a small business, uh, you, you may have more control over that. And that's something to take a look at is to make sure that people only need the privileges, use the privileges they absolutely need in order to do their job. And a lot of times on the newer systems anyway, they don't need to run as a system administrator. And then uh, this 93% of cloud deployment result of configuration errors this is, uh, we've seen this uh, in a number of times with reports from Amazon, for example, with uh, AWS services, and just the server was misconfigured and, and allowed uh, hackers or attackers to get into the system. Sometimes within an organization with their own cloud, they may, uh, they may uh, bring up a server and have it connected to the internet 
and not be fully protected or fully configured and thus it has uh, doors that are open for attackers to get in. Lynn, one more. Um, so technical cyber hygiene, when you talk about the basic steps, as I mentioned, we're talking about patching and known vulnerabilities, uh, management of privileges and proper configuration management. And, and I think statistically, somewhere between uh, 80 to 85% of uh, data breaches and ransomware issues can be solved with just these three functions. Um, some of this I mentioned already, the focus tends to be on the operating systems. And yes, I've, I've updated Windows and maybe I've updated uh, Microsoft Office to go along with it, but have you updated your Adobe products? Have you updated your browsers? Have you updated you know, your Java applications that might be on the system? And these are things that a lot of times get bypassed or uh, say in the case of Adobe, for example, a, a new version might be installed on a PC, but the old version still remains there. So we end up with multiple copies, multiple images of some of these products that then have over time have an increasing number of vulnerabilities because they haven't been patched or they haven't been taken off the systems. Uh, as far as uh, management of privileges, as I mentioned, you know, don't use privilege accounts. There's a concept of least privilege where people only have the, the access they need to do their jobs. And, and this also pertains to uh, having access to uh, services or applications within a, within a business where sometimes a small organization will hire somebody then. They're kind of a jack of all trades. And they, have, uh, they have privileged access to multiple systems, uh, sometimes just in case, but sometimes it's just by the way that they're set up and they don't really need to have all that privilege access that they're given. Um, uh, configuration management is uh, removing default accounts, uh, changing default passwords. There's been a number, number of data breaches where a server's been uh, introduced to the internet, for example, and they still have default accounts and still have the default passwords on the servers and that's just uh, that's just an open opportunity for the bad guys. Um, Windows in particular, Windows 10, the newer versions, they have a built-in firewall, they have built-in antivirus, and you know by all means, if you're running uh, Windows 10, take advantage of those and, and use those those uh, safety mechanisms. Um, Lauren, do you want me to take this or are you Yeah, yeah, I was, going looking, to go I was looking for slide numbers and they're not showing up. So go ahead. Lana. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, folks on this call, thank you so much for listening to the technical aspects. And as Lauren just shared with you, there are three in particular that will help you uh, manage 80 to 85 percent. Uh, of, uh, of the issues that you can run into. But another super major one that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on is social engineering. You hear about this. What I'm gonna share with you, you've heard before, but I cannot stress it enough. It is so critically important that we talk about social engineering and how these bad guys are literally now creating businesses to be able to, to get your corporate and personal information. So basically, what it is is exactly what this slide says. It's a uh, psychological manipulation. It's a confidence trick. They want to get information from you. Uh, they, they prey on you because you're a trusting human being, and that causes all kinds of problems. So let's talk about the different kinds of, uh, of uh, situations we can get into and what are some of the things we can do about them. All right. One of the most important aspects of so social um, engineering, of course, is the phishing. It's the attempt of being able to get in uh, to your emails or via web or different locations to 
gather information that is your personal or your corp companies or your corporate information. That is actually what phishing is. And you've all, you receive them. If your spam filter doesn't catch these, you've received emails or you've received inquiries or text messages about uh, information that they want you to click on a link or click on a graphic or download something or pay a bill online and it looks like a, a legitimate place to, to bill. And one of the biggest things that's happening right now, and I'd be very curious about with those people on this call, have any of you had an uh, unemployment claim made in your name, but it wasn't you that made the claim? Has anybody had that happen? Yeah, Lynn, I'll chime in. We've had a few employees here at Hunter that that's happened to, and we've had it with them claiming our employee's name, and then we've had it also claiming our employee as their employer. So, We've probably now seen three to five claims in the state of Ohio that have come in fraudulently. Thank you, Gabby. And that's why I'm sharing this number. For those of you who might have this happen, I will tell you it happened to me very early on personally in my name. And of course, then my, uh, my internal person that helps me with this, he called them immediately and said, this is, she owns the company. How in the world could she be applying for unemployment? Is there something I don't know? So he was all paranoid because he thought something was going on. I said, no, it was fraudulent. And then since then, we've had about five or six additional uh, employees. And we've also had them claim uh, people we don't even know that say it's Centricom. So I wanted to pull this out and provide this again as a uh, hotline for you. If that should ever happen to you, this is the number you need to call to help you get through this. There's also phishing that can happen not only via email, it can also happen via websites. And what I have here are two examples. And what's important for you to do as you're on websites, make sure you're looking at the URL. Don't click on any links in email. You can't be assured that they're going to go to the right location. It's better for you to go to the location on the web yourself and actually input the address of the URL right into your browser so you know you're going where you're supposed to go. The two items on the right-hand side, one is Amazon and one is Facebook. These are both false. They look legit, but they're not legit. And you can tell by looking at the URL at the top, for example, Amazon has two ends in it. If you weren't careful and really looking at these things, you wouldn't realize that this was not a legitimate site and you would put in your email and your password and then other folks could get into Amazon on your behalf and potentially order things, have them shipped to themselves. Just terrible things can happen. Also note Amazon and Facebook, the bad guys go after those that are most likely to give the biggest payload, the biggest return. So you'll see these on a lot of the bigger websites. So be aware of website phishing. Social media, any social media. I pulled out the example of Facebook because so many of us are on Facebook, but you also have to be careful of Twitter, Instagram, uh, some of the others as well. In this particular graphic, you can see it shows you how it starts. You have a comprom compromised Facebook user. You have a whole list of friends. Your friends trust you, so they click on the link. The link then addresses or sends um, that person to a compromised website, and then the circle keeps going. And the reason this works is because you are trusted. When you're on Facebook, all of the people that are your friends, whether they're personal or company, they trust you. They see your name. They're going to probably click on it. So when you're in Facebook or any social media, please be really, really careful of what you click on and what you forward to others. There could be a back-end payload that could be malicious. So please be careful with social media phishing as well. Text messaging. This has been really, really popular, especially the last 24 months. This is an example of how the bad guys take advantage of a human situation. And this happened to be one that's real and they played on COVID-19. So again, don't click on anything. 
It does not matter whether it's email, social media, text messages. Don't click on it. If you should, you need to immediately report it. Report the fraud. And I put two addresses down at the bottom, one for the federal FTC and then also one for the state of Ohio at the attorney general. Again, my goal in this presentation is to not only help you understand that these things are still really relevant and important, but to also give you resources as to where you can turn if something like this should happen to you personally or your organization. Another example, and notice the date on this. This is from February 9th, 2021. This is looks like a regular legitimate email from Norton for those of you that have antivirus from Norton. It is, it is a scam. And you can see where the blue arrows point. Those are two websites that are legitimate, where if you're uncertain about something, if you go to the one at the top, the imposter one, you can check and see if what you have received is legitimate. And then again, you can report fraud at the email or the URL listed below. And those two are legitimate. This slide actually did come from the FTC. And this is one of their examples that they share on their website. So again, it looks real. I would trust it. I use Norton from time to time as my antivirus. And again, they went after antivirus because a lot of people have Norton antivirus. So again, be very, very careful. Make sure you check it out check who it's from and let me let me go to the next one i love this graphic if you do nothing else from today's presentation this is a really really good graphic that goes through every aspect of an email and talks about social engineering and things to look at we don't have time today because we can spend a whole session just on this slide alone and going into each one of these and providing examples but this is a really good example or a really good PDF that helps you see what to look for in email, for email phishing. Know Before is a partner from Centricom. So if you have any questions or you have any follow-up, please, please, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to help you. Again, we don't have time to get into every aspect of email phishing, but it is the most prevalent aspect. And I wanted to make sure that I spent time and shared this particular graphic with you. So those were just four of the ways that the bad guys try to get into your network. And as we work more and more from home, the attack surface is even larger because we are working from home. We became part of the corporate network. We're logging in, we're doing things. So they have more ways of getting to us than they ever have before. So what's important as we go forward is to think before you click. Again, you, from the graphic you see, it, Facebook, Instagram, email, Yahoo, it doesn't matter. You need to be very vigilant. And how you would protect yourself, and this applies not only to Facebook, but this applies to many aspects, especially in social media, you need to be thinking about what you're doing. Set up your password and don't give it to anyone else. Set up the privacy settings. Make sure you don't uh, download apps from um, social media. Always go out to third parties and download apps on, on the Apple Store or the Android Store, things like that. And be careful who you click. Um, the bad guys will try to represent themselves as legitimate. So unless you really know the person, be careful. Or else, what can happen? Oh, the bad guys could turn you into a statistic. And Lauren and I, honestly, we don't want to see that happen. If something should happen, you can call us and we will help you, but we want to be proactive and not have this happen. So you can see as you're looking at your screen on the left, ransomware continues to be a big part of what happens from phishing. You click on something you shouldn't, they download malicious software, and then what they'll do on the right-hand side, the top, you can see four different screens that represents ways that people lock down computers. 
And then on the bottom right, you can see an actual lockdown screen. Look at the time. It actually has the date and the time, and it's counting down. If you don't pay a certain amount by a certain date in Bitcoin, then you could have your data stolen. And we don't want that to happen to you. Demands for ransomware. I thought you would find this of interest. The highest ransomware demanded from hack hackers has doubled. The highest in 2019 was 19.3, and it doubled in 2020. And the high, uh, highest ransom actually paid to hackers was 6.4 in 2019 and 12.9. The reason is, and the reason they say the highest is, is because it's recommended that you not pay hackers. There's no guarantee that they're going to release your key to open up your data. There's no guarantee, unless you move quickly, once they give you the key, that they won't come back and reinfect you before you have time to correct the situation. One of the last two points I would like to make is ransomware now is a service. You can literally go out on the dark web and download with no technical skills how to do a ransomware attack. And one of the companies, as you can see below, Cerber, they actually are online with banner ads and forum postings on the dark web. So this is going to only increase. If we think it's bad now, it's just going to continue. And ransomware as a service is big business. It's no longer the college kid in their basement. It's no longer small groups of people. It is actually being done by businesses for a profit and by nation states to get into governments and others. So what do you do? How do you avoid it? Well, this whole presentation talks about that. Only click on verified links. Don't click on any links that are forwarded from social media or within social media. Be careful of email attachments. Be careful of downloading software. Use security software, antivirus, things like that. Go to authorized, mar authorized marketplaces the Apple or the Android store directly. Don't download from another location. Use VPNs when you access public Wi-Fi. Never give out your personal information. Pay particular attention to popular games, especially those of you that have children or grandchildren. They like to download all kinds of stuff, and a lot of hidden bad stuff is in what they're downloading, so they need to be careful. Back up your data, do research, and again, never pay the ransom. It's highly recommended never to do that because you don't know if you're going to get the data back anyway. So this concludes our presentation today. My last two slides uh, are some action steps and takeaways based on what Lauren shared on the technical side and what I just shared on the human side. So as you leave today, as I said, Angie has this presentation, or feel free to reach out to me, and Lauren and I will forward it to you. What we suggest to you is talk with your technical support. The, the items that Lauren shared with you, patching, management of privileges, configuration management, uh, those are the things that you should think about immediately. Please, please, please. They will help with 80 to 85% of you being protected. Increase your awareness of social engineering tactics. We tried to give you an overview of the four major areas today, web, social media, text, and phishing. Consider end user security training. And again, know before the company I told you about, if you'd like some assistance, reach out to us. Um, they offer end user security training, and we highly recommend something like that, even if you just do it on a quarterly basis to keep people informed of what's going on. And then report fraud to the FTC or the Ohio Attorney General. Those are things you can do. And then the last one, ransomware, prepare yourself. I hate to tell you folks, it's only a matter of time. Even for my own company, I worry about it. Lauren helps us on the risk side. 
It's a matter of time. It's not a matter of if they get in. It's a matter of when. And are you ready? Have you gone through these scenarios with your company? Some of these are, what is your risk tolerance? How long can you afford to be down? What are the best and worst case scenarios if I'm down for two hours or I'm down for two weeks? You, do you pay the ransom or don't you? Some companies, they pay it. They don't have any other choice because they haven't prepared. Run different scenarios if you do pay or you don't pay. Understand Bitcoin. Don't wait until you have a problem. That's how people pay. It's through Bitcoin. Prepare a business continuity plan so that as this is, if it happens, you know immediately what you need to do. Have your backups ready. Know who your go-to team is. Who's your first call? And on your go-to team, also you need to not only have technical, but you also need to have your marketing or PR people because this is going to affect your brand if you have a down uh, period of time and people can't access you. And then per the FBI, don't pay the ransom. And I included a link there, as I did other uh, links within this document, to help you if you should have an issue. Uh, this is a little information about Centricom, which we gave you. So this concludes our presentation. I'd like to open it up for discussion. And any other questions that may have come in via chat, Gabby, if there are any out there? Um, oh my goodness, Lauren and Lynn, thank you so much. This was eye-opening um, for someone who thought I knew something about this. This is really eye-opening. So thank you so much. There was a lot of information you covered. There were some questions along the way. And Lauren, thank you for answering some of those in chat already. Um, we had a question about what browser you would recommend using, which Lauren has answered for us that he would favor Chrome, um, but using MS Edge as well. And then a question about password saving using password products like LastPass. And Lauren's advice there was um, personally doesn't use one. LastPass had some recent changes. So there, it doesn't seem like, Lauren, there's a tool that you would recommend at this point. Um, and then Lauren put a great tip in chat about how you can see who has administrative privileges in their account internally by um, following the simple steps that he has in chat again to check who is an administrator so you can protect your, your business best. Um, I have a question and please put any questions in chat or feel free to chime in. We are a smaller group, so I think we can certainly do that. And um, Lynn and Lauren, hopefully you wouldn't mind if we did that. I have a question about CEO fraud. This is something we actually train new hires on here. We see this a lot. What is mm -hmm. the advice here? Um, you know, are there tools that can detect this that we can install on computers or do you just need to train your employees and stay vigilant about CEO fraud? Uh, that was one of the items we thought about including in this presentation. Uh, absolutely. It is rampant right now. And again, for those of you that don't know what uh, C-suite or CEO, CIO, uh, what that would be, that is where someone masks and make, makes emails and uh, inquiries look exactly like it came from the president, the CFO, whoever. And then someone doesn't realize that it's not them. And we have actually, and I can give you a case story, we had a manufacturer whose uh, CFO left on vacation for two weeks. The CEO was literally um, managing the bank accounts and all the bills and all of that. And it was a middle-sized company. It wasn't huge. It was maybe, I don't know, three, $4 million company. And basically what happened was the bad guys had been lurking. They created a website that looked exactly like the bank. So when the CEO went in, the CEO put in the username and password thinking it was the legitimate site. They siphoned off $50,000 before they realized that there was an issue. That's a, that's a real case from a client of ours. So absolutely, the, the, the message that, that came in to the CEO, he wasn't sophisticated enough. He didn't have the training he needed to recognize it. It looked legit. He went to the bank to do what was needed, and the bad guys got his login name and password. So absolutely. Lauren, do you want to add anything to that? Um, well, I can give another example, uh, uh, actually a personal example in my, my previous company that I worked with, um, and an email came in to the uh, corporate treasurer 
uh, as that appeared to be from the CEO directing him to uh, urgently send some money to a specific account, wire some money to an account that was somebody that the CEO knew that was expecting this payment, they needed it quickly. And, and, he, and he told the, the treasurer to make sure that this was paid right away. Uh, and to one of the points that, that Lynn made earlier, the email had one, one letter off on the uh, email mm -hmm. address that, from the, that looked like it came from the CEO. As it turns out, the treasurer and the uh, uh, controller and the CEO were all in the same meeting together when, when the treasurer received this email. And so, you know, he looked at it and said, hey, you know, did, did you really send this? And, and of course the answer was no. Uh, but that's, uh, that's how effective they can be. And they, they pray often uh, in larger companies, they pray, they, they, uh, on, they count on the, the separation of duties and sometimes mm -hmm. if uh, somebody gets an email internally directing them to do something, they wouldn't challenge their CEO saying, you know, did you really send this? They would, they would take it and they may, even if they may think it's strange, they would still go ahead and do it. And in, in this case, this was a, this was a, a six figure amount that they were being asked to wire to this particular company that didn't really exist. So. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. yeah, this is big business. So, Gabby, are there other things? We limited our presentation only because there's just so much we could talk about. Were there other things oh, that maybe absolutely. you've been aware of? And Hunter, yeah, I mean, are there other things that we want to? So, I think it's um, it's it's so important to note all the different areas. One of the areas I had a question on technically, Lauren, was about the patch updates and patch management. So is that enough to simply tell your employees, you know, everyone wants to sleep their computer at the end of the day. And as a business owner, you're like, shut down so you can catch those updates. How can we as business owners watch out that our employees are um, updating their computers or that patch management can kind of automatically happen um, if we, we don't have an IT person in house? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question and one that a, a lot of organizations struggle with. But the, the, the easiest thing to do, at least in the Microsoft wor world, is to allow automatic updates. And, and that way, you know, there's really not much of a question other than them having to be online at some point in the time, you know, to allow that update to happen. Now, um, you know, personally, on my, on my personal devices, I have them set up for automatic updates, but I have, but it asks me if I'm ready for that update to happen. And so I have some control over it. I don't want to do it at two o'clock in the afternoon when I'm working on a presentation for somebody. Uh, I want some control over it, but, but in the same note, it'll only allow me to postpone that update so many times. Okay. So at some point I have to, I have to say, yes, go ahead and do it mm -hmm. or, or no, do it at three o'clock in the morning or something like that. Now, in, in businesses, uh, what you run into sometimes is, is having software that you're running that that may not be compatible with an update, mm -hmm. and and that that's a risk mm -hmm. that that does happen, and that's why some people you know are really hesitant to, to update their software. But um, as inconvenient as it can be, it's it's still the the, the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. I know, I. I forced myself to do it on my company PC. I mean, it's not unusual for me to have 10 Word documents and 15 Excel documents and <laughs> stuff open and that I'm looking at or working on and have to make sure that all that's saved off or, or shut down in order to be able to do the update. But, but, I, but I know the importance of it and I just, I forced myself to do it. Okay. Or it forces mm -hmm. me because like I said, I can only ignore <laughs> it for so many times. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Well, Are there other F questions? I think Janet had a, a question. Um, just a follow up on the whole password saving thing, because I'm clearly lazy um, <laughs> about it, and I know it's not good. 
And I know a lot of my passwords are the same, which you will tell me they should not be, and they should be changed automatically. Correct. So if you don't mm -hmm. use something like LastPass or save them in their bra in your browser, Lauren and I were exchanging on the chat. What do you use to manage your passwords? Well, you know, for, for years they've they've talked about you know not writing down your password and and or, or otherwise record them. And from a from a security professional perspective, I understand that. But in today's world, you have so many different things that you have passwords in. You know that just isn't always practical. Now, I will say that I if if I do write them down, I keep them. I don't do it on the computer. You know, so I don't have a spreadsheet on my computer that has all my passwords. Uh, occasionally, I will write some down that I, I really need to remember that I don't use that often. And I have a notebook, you know, where I where I keep those. I mean, well, the worst thing that could happen is somebody, you know, why would somebody break into my house and steal my notebook with my passwords in it? I mean, that's not a likely scenario, right? It's possible, certainly, but not likely. So... Uh, that's one mechanism. I have a I have a method that I use for assigning passwords, and uh, and it's probably if somebody really wanted to sit down and figure out what my pattern is, they probably could do that. But I do not use the same password for any site. Every every place I have a password is unique, and, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of them. So. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> an awful lot of sites today let you say, I forgot my password. And, and I use that a lot. Yep. I just say, okay, I, I forgot it and I reset it mm -hmm. and I do what I need to do. And it's not something that I do frequently. So, you know, it takes a couple extra minutes, but at least I don't have to remember it or have to write it down someplace. And, and Lynn, how about you? Same thing? Uh, same sort of thing. Yeah. But what, what Lauren said is I have um, in my head, I have a, depending on what side I go, I go to, I have a certain way I always do it, but it refers to that particular site. So every time I go, I know that I'm going to use this from the name, or I'm going to use this from the address, or I'm going to use this so that I, at least when I go to a new site, um, I, I have a really good idea of what my pattern is. And it's different enough that I don't think someone would ever be able to get into it, but that's how I do it as well. I mean, it just, because, and I do have different passwords, not every site. Um, I do have different passwords for all of my financials. I don't use the same password for any of my financials, but everything else I might use more than once, but not too often. That would be one of the things I would recommend is all your financials should have different passwords. It's, it's just for your protection. It, it just is. I, I know we're getting to the end of the uh, time, Angie, and I think you wanted time for some other things. As we close today, if you've got other questions, please reach out to us. Um, as I said, we're happy to send you the, the presentation. Angie has it, our website, um, and we can put our, our addresses in the chat or our email in the chat. I would like to extend an invitation to you all. Um, October 27th, we're gonna be doing our 20th annual Information Assurance Forum. Lauren will be one of the speakers along with uh, a gentleman from Highland, uh, or we think a gentleman from the FBI, uh, a gentleman from, um, let me think, uh, GJM, uh, a, a accounting firm. What we're doing is we're having a business luncheon for the region and it's our 20th year doing this. The topic is relevant to today. It's on remote, and teleworkers and how to keep them safe because they're now part of the corporate network. So if you're interested in that as things progress and we get closer to October 27th, it's going to be in person and friendly. It's going to be live streamed and it's also going to be via Zoom. We did the same thing last year. I will put the address um, of our website. If you're interested, you can go out and look at what we did last year. And then let me know if you want to know more about it as we're, we're just working on it right now. But it's very relevant to our conversation today.